Come on, Will, give me my intro, dude. Yeah, it's tearless time. That's right, knuckleheads. I am uniquely qualified to rank iPhones from best to worst, S tier to F tier. Let's start with the original iPhone. Okay, now you would be probably inclined to say, okay, <laughs> this is an obvious S tier phone. Because if you look at the totality of the smartphone market today, pretty much all of them pay homage back to this phone. Now, no, it was not the first smartphone, not anywhere near close to that, but it was the first phone with a true multi-touch glass display. There was no physical keyboard. It proved that that could work a software keyboard. It had these containerized apps on a grid on a home spring that both Android and iOS have, you know, kind of continued to use over the last 15 years. This was the OG. But here's the thing. Despite its incredible build quality and innovative features, most people look at this with rose-colored glasses because they never owned one. <laughs> but I did, and this is not an S-tier phone, okay? There were a lot of problems with this. For starters, it was only 2G. We often call it the iPhone 2G now, and people think that means second generation or something. No, that means Edge. It did not support 3G data, which was already the norm by the time the iPhone came out. Furthermore, it had no multimedia messaging support, no MMS. This was before WhatsApp and Telegram and all of these apps. You used SMS to talk to people and you could not send multimedia uh, pictures and you could not receive them either. My Motorola Razr could do that. That was a big problem. There was also no video recording in the camera. There was no native app store. Steve Jobs pitched these kind of web app style uh, things because the, the browser Safari was allegedly desktop class despite not supporting Flash, which was very much a thing back then. There was no exchange support. And so that pretty much disqualified it from being used in any type of business. And then to put the nail in the coffin, it was only available on one carrier, AT&T at $499 starting price point with a two year contract. It was prohibitively expensive. Also, uh, there wasn't a flush headphone jack because Steve Jobs thought that it looked ugly, which required everyone to either use Apple's own headphones or buy dongles. It was the original dongle phone. And uh, yeah, so this is not S tier. It's not even A tier or B tier. This is a C tier phone and pretty much only C tier phone out of respect because it was the OG and changed the course of the rest of the phones. So it's only uphill from here, right? Well, not necessarily, but maybe on this one, the iPhone 3G. Okay, what was good? Well, obviously it brought 3G and it added GPS instead of triangulation via cell tower that the original iPhone had, making you know uh, navigation actually possible, competed with Garmin devices of the time. Uh, it brought iOS 2, which had major improvements. There was App Store support. Uh, we had native apps now on the phone. There was exchange support for business people. There was support for push email, but it still lacked a lot of pro features. There was still no MMS. There was no copy and paste. There was no Bluetooth stereo audio. It was still AT&T only. It had the same camera and the same processor, etc. The battery sucked because of 3G, which was fairly inefficient. The new plastic shell was cheap. It scratched a ton compared to the aluminum OG model, but compared to other smartphones of the time. So this sounds like an F tier phone, right? Well, no, because it launched at $199 on contract. This was huge because that made it the first iPhone that actually sold. Nobody bought the OG iPhone, but people did buy this one. E tier. <laughs> It's, it wasn't a good phone. Now, okay, fine. Well, let me let me let me trace it back. I did start first making videos with the iPhone 3G on YouTube, so out of respect, that's going to be a D tier from me. All right, iPhone 3GS. Okay, the iPhone 3GS was the first S year that kind of later became to be known as like the slightly better model, but it originally meant speed. And that's because holy freaking crap was the iPhone 3GS crazy fast. It's difficult to remember how much faster the iPhone 3GS was, but it was more than twice as fast as the iPhone 3G with uh, double the memory. The processor was like two and a half times faster. And then it all also increased the available storage to 32 gigs, which was great for the plethora of new apps and games that were making their way to the app store. 
Um, it also had an improved camera. It came with a three megapixel camera over the iPhone 3G's two megapixel camera. It also had autofocus that could short, uh, shoot video in VGA quality. Um, there was an oleophobic coating which helped for fingerprints and it also added a bunch of smaller stuff like a magnometer uh, for a compass support and also GPS. Bluetooth 2.1 for stereo audio, and uh, HSDPA for, uh, well, the iPhone 3GS. It was, it was a really, really good phone, despite its continued lackluster build quality. This was the first truly good iPhone. And for that, it is B tier, at worst, maybe even A tier. Spoiler alert, the S tier iPhone is any iPhone running PIA. Look, private internet access has been a sponsor on this channel for a while, and you have no doubt heard the pitch. So let me go off the beaten path and rapid fire off five reasons why PIA is better than any other no log VPN. Number one, you can simultaneously connect 10 devices, which is double what pretty much every other VPN allows. Number two, unlike a lot of other VPNs, PIA can actually bypass Netflix in most regions, in addition to a bunch of less stringent video sites uh, like a BBC iPlayer, Disney Plus, uh, Amazon Prime, etc. Number three, PIA's MACE system blocks access to domains that are not publicly accessible, meaning that malware and trackers and advertisements, etc., will not be able to follow you online very easily. Number four, PIA has open sourced its apps and libraries, proving to us, its customers, that they are serious about transparency. And number five, PIA supports true network-wide peer-to-peer support rather than just on a few select servers like most VPNs. Additionally, you get port forwarding support, which allows you to bypass firewalls to improve torrenting speeds. I have been a paying customer for years before they ever decided to sponsor the channel, so take that for what it's worth. Try PIA today with my link below and save 83% at checkout plus four months for free. That's right, the phone that almost cannot be topped, the iPhone 4. Now, this was the first iPhone that had any significant leaks. This phone was completely spoiled by Gizmodo. And this was back when Apple had insanely secretive control of their supply chain, and also because no one was that interested in the iPhone to be incentivized to provide chain leaks. It, it was a big deal, and Steve Jobs was pissed. Stop me if you've already seen this. <laughs> and when we saw the phone, we are like, well, this looks weird. But then it launched, and it was Gorgeous. <laughs> the antenna lines were built into the stainless steel frame, which is something that wouldn't return until the iPhone 10, almost a decade later. It was sandwiched in glass, um, making it like pretty much the most repairable iPhone ever, which was a huge perk. I fixed so many iPhone 4s, I can't even begin to tell you. Uh, I used to own an iPhone repair shop, Screen Clinic. Uh, but its flagship feature was that it had a retina display with a 326 PPI. Retina display was uh, the term that was coined first with the iPhone 4. And even though Jobs' introduction of retina seems a little silly all these years later, iPhone 4 screens still look really, really good. And the original iPhones, for example, looks horrible. <laughs> it is a massive leap in quality. It was also the first iPhone with Apple-designed silicon. Kinda. Uh, the A4 and the history behind the beginnings of Apple Silicon is super interesting. Maybe we'll do a video on that in the future. Uh, Apple also doubled the RAM again. It brought 720p video support for the uh, rear camera. And then they introduced the FaceTime camera. Uh, selfies were only a matter of time from here on out. Um, it had a gyroscope as well, which was pretty cool. Um, there were tons of games that took advantage of this, for example. And then uh, it had a 32 gig storage option as well. It launched on AT&T, of course, but there was also a CDMA version available to Verizon customers for the first time ever. Uh, and then it brought iOS 4, which added multitasking, HDR photos, FaceTime, FaceTime was invented with iOS 4. Uh, there were custom wallpapers and folders and spell check and more. iOS 4 was a huge update. Now, the iPhone 4 did have that little antenna gate debacle, which is a hilarious press keynote. If you have time, go watch this. Steve Jobs is so agitated that he even has to be there. But the issue was mostly repaired with a bumper case and, well, a software update that basically fudged the cellular strength numbers a bit. Um, this phone, absolutely, 100% A tier. Okay, now we get to the iPhone 4S. This was 
Actually, a fairly, this was the first like true S year where the improvements were a little more minimal. Uh, they moved the antennas to prevent Antenna Gate 2, uh, basically confirming that Antenna Gate was real. And then Siri made its debut on the iPhone 4S, as did iCloud. Um, but what the iPhone 4S really kind of brought that was different was a very powerful GPU from STX. It was actually the same GPU that was in the PS Vita handheld gaming system. Um, the phone brought an improved camera with an extra lens, an IR filter, a wider aperture, and it also debuted its first ISP inside of the A5 chip. So all in all, a fairly small year, but they perfected pretty much every problem that the nearly perfect iPhone 4 had. This is 100%, without a doubt, indisputably an S-tier phone and maybe the best iPhone ever made. Okay, iPhone 5. I actually never owned an iPhone 5 because I was out of the country on a mission for my church, um, but I have felt the iPhone 5 extensively. When you pick the iPhone 5 up, as compared to the iPhone 4, your first thought is, wow, this thing is light, and wow, this thing feels kind of cheap. <laughs> they moved to aluminum, and even though the iPhone 5 is an objectively beautiful phone, this was before Apple got really good at aluminum, and this thing would dent with such ease. I've never seen an iPhone 5 that doesn't look totally battered, whereas most iPhone 4 and 4S still look really great today. Regardless of that, there were a bunch of hardware changes that were big deals. Most notably, the screen size that had been 3.5 inches for the first several iPhones increased to a still small but larger 4-inch display, still retina. Uh, the new A6 SoC was a big upgrade as well. They doubled the memory count to one gig. Um, it introduced a dual core processor clocked at 1.3 gigahertz. And there was for the first time ever a 64 gig storage option. So big performance improvement there. Additionally, it was the first iPhone to have a BSI camera. Uh, it was 40% faster at opening and taking photos. It was significantly better in low light, but maybe most uh, famously, it introduced a new port. Now there was a lot of kind of frustration about this when they brought Lightning, uh, obsoleting the 2003 30 pin dock connector that had been supported by Apple for, you know, what, almost 10 years. However, uh, it was old, it was time to go, and Lightning, well, we're still stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's a bummer. It did introduce LTE, which was a big deal, and it allowed for FaceTime over cellular. All of this stuff makes it sound like this should be an A-tier phone, maybe better. But it was also the phone that removed Google Maps as the default Maps app and replaced it with Apple Maps, which, to put it nicely, was a disaster. And uh, the launch was so botched that Scott Forstall, who was in charge of the app, was asked, maybe demanded by Tim Cook to apologize. Forstall said no, refused to sign an apology letter, and shortly left Apple thereafter. <laughs> So that's going to make this thing a B-tier phone because its launch was really, really rough. So it's redemption time with the iPhone 5S. This was the first iPhone to introduce biometrics. Touch ID came on the iPhone 5S. It also came in a gold color for the first time ever. The new A7 chip uh, was Apple's first 64-bit iPhone, and the iPhone 5S, I think, is Apple's longest supported iPhone ever, um, uh, subsequently. It's, it's amazing how long this iPhone remains supported. Um, but it also came with uh, an M7 motion co-processor, which they don't ever really talk about those anymore, um, but mostly because we've moved beyond that and they're built onto the SoC. Um, but it uh, allowed the phone to uh, be aware of its uh, gyroscopic activity when in sleep mode. And so um, it introduced ways to rake for the first time, which was pretty cool. Um, there was the secure enclave on the chip as well for biometrics. The camera got a big update, increased to a uh, f2.2 aperture. Um, the sensor got quite a bit larger as well. And then they had a true tone flash for the first time with amber and cool LEDs respectively. It was also the first iPhone that supported slow motion video at 120 frames per second. And then iOS 7. Despite looking pretty much awful, um, this is <clears throat> a product of Johnny Ive after Scott Forstall left. Um, we still have inklings of iOS 7 today. Um, certainly visually it looks kind of similar. But uh, iOS 7 brought a ton of new features. Control Center, uh, AirDrop was introduced. The Notification Center was completely overhauled. It introduced the card multitasking system. CarPlay was released. Siri was improved. I mean, all of these things we still have iOS, uh, have in iOS, and that was iOS 7. That was the iPhone 5S. This is a good phone. But, it's a C-tier phone. 
and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. Hold on, don't go into the comments. But first, we need to talk about the iPhone 5C. I bet you forgot about this one. This phone released on the same day as the iPhone 5S. And it was the same hardware that was in the now year old iPhone 5, but it was in an beautifully, unapologetically plastic enclosure to reduce cost to $99 on contract for eight gigs, which in theory sounds good, bring iPhone to the masses. But really it was no better than a year old iPhone 5, which had entered kind of promotional pricing around the same time the 5C launched. And then to make matters worse, the 5C was really specifically targeted for Asian markets, most more particularly uh, India. And uh, it was just still too expensive to really uh, take off there. Um, it was panned as a Lumia ripoff. Nobody really liked the colors. Everyone thought they were too bland. I actually think they're great, but that's in retrospect. I have one of these and the build quality is not good. It is not up to par with basically any iPhone ever. Maybe the iPhone 3G and 3GS, but those phones were very old. It was an excuse back then. It was not an excuse when the iPhone 5C launched in 2013. This is an E-tier phone. Should we make it an F? It's an F-tier phone. Sorry, iPhone 5C. There was just no reason to buy it over a year old iPhone 5. Okay, iPhone 6. Now, when I got back from Bolivia in May of 2014, the iPhone 5S, which was still the latest flagship from Apple, it looked very out of place compared to pretty much every other phone on the market. We've looked at these phones in a vacuum, but the reality was is Android was picking up steam and fast. And the iPhone 5S was really the only remaining small phone on the market. And there were certain devices like the HTC One M8, which I purchased when I got back from Bolivia instead of an iPhone 5S was Oh my gosh, what a beautiful phone. It was faster. It had a beautiful large screen. The cameras were great. The battery was stellar. The speakers were incredible. Everything the iPhone 5S lacked. And so despite Steve Jobs' insistence that there would never be a big screened iPhone on the market, well, the market and Tim Cook had other ideas, I guess. And three years after Jobs' death, the iPhone 6 was released. And it really modernized the iPhone with two screen options. There was a 4.7 inch size and then a 5.5. And this was a massive step up from the iPhone 5S's four inch screen. The squared iPhone's design was replaced by a rounded design that would stay until 2021, actually. Uh, the glass was slightly curved to match the body of uh, the aluminum phone. I mean, it was a fantastic feeling phone. Um, the A8 and M8 chips brought 25% uh, improved CPU speeds and 50% faster GPU speeds. So good, but not that crazy. Um, there was a barometer that was added. LTE Advanced also arrived. Apple Pay was introduced for NFC payments. It shot 1080p video on the video camera for the first time, even though the camera module itself was basically identical to the iPhone 5S. Uh, oh, and then the iPhone 6 Plus added optical image stabilization for the first time. On the software side, there was a bunch of new features. iCloud Photo Library and the Photos app itself kind of introduced precise editing controls. Um, iMessage brought group messaging. Uh, there was Snapchat style iMessage support for disappearing photos and videos, which I don't even know if that's available anymore. I don't, I don't think it is. I know they do that for audio clips. Uh, for voice memos, but I don't think... Anyway, so that was the thing. Uh, HomeKit was introduced as well. Uh, and then iOS 8 allowed Touch ID to be used by third-party applications like 1Password or your bank account. Pretty cool. Then there was Bengate. <laughs> uh, here's the thing. All these years later, and frankly, while it was happening, I didn't think Bengate was a very big deal at all. I thought it was overblown. Um, I don't think Lou had bad intentions, but I also think that, you know, it was a bit overdone. Um, not a big deal, despite the massive wave of controversy. Um, but Apple did choose thinness over practicality. And so subsequently, not only did the phone bend, if you tried to bend it, but battery life was very poo-poo. Um, and this was bad on a market with, frankly, Android phones that had pretty good battery life. So this is, at best, a B-tier phone. Huge improvement to the iPhone line, but eh. now we get to the iPhone 6S. This was the first iPhone that I could have purchased, but didn't. And part of it was because I was enjoying and, uh, well, frankly, reviewing Android phones at the time. But the iPhone success just wasn't that compelling. Uh, it came in rose gold, pink for the first time. Ooh, big whoop. Uh, ben Gate was allegedly addressed with Series 7000 aluminum, but frankly, just better internal reinforcement. 
Touch ID became slightly faster and the battery increased in size marginally. But the A9, the new SoC, was a pretty big step up. It was a 70% faster CPU, 90% faster GPU, and double the RAM count to two gigs. It also brought hardware support for uh, Heath and HEVC video and photos. Um, the rear camera moved to a 12 megapixel sensor, uh, and the front camera moved from a 1.3 megapixel camera to a five megapixel camera. Um, the rear camera recorded 4K video for the first time ever, uh, and the phone introduced one of my favorite features that I cry about about once a week, 3D Touch. We're gonna to talk about that in the iPhone 7 because that's where I really feel like 3D Touch came into its own. But frankly, the iPhone 6S, it just fixed pretty much everything wrong with the iPhone 6. Despite the upgrades being pretty minor, and still having not a very good battery, um, it was a big improvement. But the battery life still sucked because it was thin, thin, thin. You go back and hold a 6S today and you're like, holy crap, when is Apple gonna make phones this thin again? <laughs> I mean, our phones now are like comically large by comparison. So poop of battery life, that gives it at best C tier. Now we get to the iPhone SE. This is the spiritual successor to the iPhone 5C, but it corrected all of the iPhone C's wrongs. It was an iPhone 6S, all of the internals, the SOC, the incredible, incredibly powerful phone, but inside of an iPhone 5S body. That was amazing for people that wanted that, and it was every bit as powerful as the iPhone 6S. But as you can imagine, subsequently, the battery life was horrible. Um, it was really, really, really bad. I guess unsurprising, given the form factor, and so I would be inclined to give it a C, um, but it was always kind of a budget niche phone, and poor battery life, wasn't because of stubbornness by Apple and making things thin like in the iPhone success, but just because that was the reality of putting powerful hardware inside of an iPhone 5S's chassis. So this was actually a good effort and I'm gonna make this a B tier phone. Okay, now we get to the iPhone 7. The iPhone 7 was probably one of the most controversial phones of all time because it removed, as you remember, the headphone jack. Courage which was pretty much wholly unnecessary. Now you'd think that that would give it instantly an automatic F tier. But my one word review of iPhone 7 would be this, battery. The A10 chip is the first fusion chip that Apple ever introduced. So it had two low power cores and two high power cores, which made it incredible in the battery life department. The iPhone 6 and iPhone 6S never had very good battery because they were so stupidly thin. And the iPhone 7 beefed up a little bit. Um, and it was done for battery purposes. This was a much appreciated change. It was also the first iPhone with an IP67 water rating, making it water resistant. Apple ditched the clicking home button, which was beginning to feel antiquated in favor of that virtual one that clicked with the Taptic engine. So it felt like a button, but it actually wasn't. And this is where Apple really focused on 3D touch, an amazing feature that frankly just never realized its full potential because Apple's human interface guidelines sucked and their stubbornness for uh, intuition and things being uh, natural just prevented progression. I mean, uh, touch, 3D Touch was so cool. But again, there was nowhere in the OS that told you there is something behind this. You just had to randomly push on random elements on the screen. That made no sense. And when app developers tried to show you you could 3D Touch something, Apple said, no, you're not allowed to do that because that's not intuitive. What? And furthermore, 3D Touch also didn't have any manuals from the OS, so a lot of people just frankly didn't even know it existed, which, <laughs> I mean, come on. Now, we have moved to Haptic Touch, and it's fine, but it's not as good. It's just not. You can't push randomly anywhere on the keyboard now and go into cursor selection mode. You have to go to the space bar and hold it and wait long enough for it to say, oh, you held this now. It was so cool to have a force layer, but Apple just blew it. Ugh and ran. What are we talking about? Oh yeah, the iPhone 7. <laughs> so it also saw the addition of a telephoto lens on the 7 Plus, as well as, for the first time ever, a portrait mode feature. It was pretty bad on the iPhone 7, but it was present. The headphone jack omission was frustrating, um, certainly, and, and in, in retrospect, I still don't think they should have removed it, but at minimum, they included a dongle in the box. And so overall, because of the real quality of life improvements, significantly better battery, a significantly faster SOC, and a much better camera. This is, uh, without a doubt, an A-tier phone. Um, and it also came, not that this really matters, but it's kind of fun, with the largest quantity of color options of any iPhone ever. Uh, except for maybe the newest ones. 
but maybe not. iPhone 12 and 13 come in a lot of colors. Anyway, now we move to the iPhone 8. This phone is a fantastic phone and the pinnacle of iPhone 6 design. I mean, this is as good as it gets in this kind of round bodied design. However, um, it wasn't a big upgrade. <laughs> they added glass to the back. Uh, the display brought true tone for the first time, which some people view as a feature. And the camera saw uh, improvements, but fairly minor ones at that. The A11 Bionic introduced a hexa-core processor for the first time ever, rather than a quad-core one, but that's, that's pretty much it. And because this phone uh, launched alongside the iPhone X, it just looked really dated. So it was a great phone, but it's aged quickly when compared to Apple's future phone plans. And to make matters worse, Apple didn't reduce its price relative to the launch price of the iPhone 7, thanks to the iPhone 10 being crazy expensive. So it was the same expensive cost of every other iPhone, it just had almost no visual upgrades. And so it really wasn't a good option at all over older iPhones and you'd have been better suited with an iPhone 7. So overall, I'm gonna give this a, this is a D-tier phone actually, despite it being a really, really, frankly good phone. Now we get to the, what the, what is this doing behind there? Oh, okay, we'll just put this up here. All right. Okay. <laughs> now let's talk about the iPhone 10. The iPhone 10 was the iPhone's most significant redesign ever. Obviously, they dropped the home button in favor of gestures, which is something that launched a little bit rough. I made videos about my complaints concerning the UI, and most but not all of them have been addressed. People go back onto that video and they type comments like, well, this hasn't aged well, but I go back and watch this video and I think, no, it has aged well because all of these things have been fixed and addressed since I made this video. However, the iPhone X didn't just bring a new slightly broken UI, it brought a lot of amazing innovations. An OLED display for the first time ever to an iPhone, which yes, was not much of an innovation. Android phones had had this for literally years and years and years and years, but it was a very good OLED display. It also came with True Tone, which again, some people consider to be a feature, and it was the first iPhone to return to stainless steel, polished stainless steel this time around, for the first time since the iPhone 4S. It also introduced Face ID in absence of Touch ID, uh, because again, there was no home button. Um, it introduced Qi wireless charging to the iPhone. It obviously had the A11 Bionic, just like the iPhone 8. And uh, while the iPhone 10 is now nearing five years old, um, it feels as good as it did when it was new. And, and basically it feels the same as my iPhone 13. It's just slightly slower. This phone has aged remarkably well. The silver iPhone 10 is still maybe peak Apple design. It is gorgeous. This is absolutely an A tier phone. Man. No, A tier. I wanna make it S tier, but let's, let's cool my jets. Okay, because now we're getting the iPhone 10 S. Mm. <laughs> iPhone 10 S. Okay. So I take it back, something I said earlier. I said that the iPhone 6S was the only iPhone that I didn't own, but I actually didn't own the iPhone XS either. Um, I won a bet, in fact, against John Gruber because I did not buy this phone. Um, I just had no interest in it, and the improvements over the iPhone 10 didn't seem that notable, and I was really happy still with my iPhone 10. The features were pretty much identical to the iPhone 10, save for um, a new A12 Bionic processor that was built for the first time on a seven nanometer process, and it was the first iPhone with an L-shaped battery, which did increase capacity, but that's, that's pretty much it. It was a very, very, very minor year, uh, making this a D-tier upgrade, unless you wanted the Max variant, in which case, uh, because there was no Max with the iPhone 10, in which case that would be like a B, maybe A-tier. But um, we're not doing them separate, so D-tier <laughs> it is. Now we get to the iPhone 10R. This launched with the iPhone 10S. It brought the design of the iPhone X in a cheaper, more accessible package with aluminum instead of stainless steel and uh, an LCD that was edge to edge. <laughs> I put that in air quotes because the bezels were quite ginormous over the OLED that was present on more expensive models. There was a problem with the iPhone XR and I just, I don't understand why people found this to be acceptable. It had a dismal PPI. Um, it was 326 versus the iPhone 10's 458 PPI. It was like an 800p resolution screen. It couldn't even natively display 1080p content. And again, the, the bezel was just so comically large that it almost looked worse than not trying to be bezel-less at all. Um, 
And that was partly because it didn't have a display controller that could be folded over on itself like the OLED panel that was present in the iPhone XS. The phone was also much thicker due to the LCD panel, and it also lacked 3D touch, which the iPhone XS had, introducing haptic touch instead. There just wasn't room. And then it also only had one single wide-angle camera. I am really not a fan of the iPhone XR. It sold really, really well, but I don't like it. <laughs> it did have the same chip as the iPhone XS, and battery life was comparable to the iPhone XS, though not as good as the iPhone XS Max. But other than that, uh, eh. I'm going to get hated on this because I know people love this phone, but I just don't see the appeal, and I'm giving it a C tier at best. Its only redeeming quality, literally, is price. And uh, hey, you know, if, if you're mad about its C tier position, at least it's higher than the iPhone XS, okay? Quit your whining. <laughs> Now we get to the iPhone 11 Pro. This is the first iPhone with a Pro moniker, and that's because it was so much more professional than all the other phones. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But it did introduce the best iPhone color ever made, Midnight Green. I will fight you to the death. I know that's not a popular opinion, but it's true. Get over it. Uh, this phone shipped with the A13 Bionic, which sported four gigs of RAM. It was also the first and only iPhone to be sold with an 18 watt fast charger. The display got quite a bit brighter with 800 nits of standard brightness and 1200 nits of peak brightness, making its outdoor visibility significantly better than your average OLED. But there's really two big upgrades with the iPhone 11 Pro. It's the first iPhone to have a triple camera array, and, and that in and of itself isn't that important, though it did bring an ultra-wide, wide, and telephoto lens system to the phone. What made them good is that the cameras were significant upgrades over the iPhone XS cameras. If you today look at an iPhone 11 Pro photo uh, versus the iPhone 13 Pro, you can notice a difference, but they're very slight. Get an iPhone XS, and it looks way worse. The iPhone 11 Pro was just like ahead of the curve. The second thing is that it had perhaps the best battery life of any iPhone ever. There are modern benchmarks on YouTube of the iPhone 11 Pro versus newer iPhones, and it still wins out. The battery life on this thing was second to none. And then the hand feel is better than any other iPhone to date. I'm sorry, even though the iPhone 12 and 13 are beautiful with their squared edges, they're not as comfortable. And the iPhone 11 Pro just feels right. The weighting is perfect. Oh my gosh. This is, I'm going to say it, my favorite iPhone ever. And it is without a doubt an S tier phone amongst the best of the best. Apple's two, wait, that's not an Apple phone. What is that? Okay, now we get to the iPhone 11. This phone I'm less enthusiastic about because it was basically the 10R that Apple found pretty much everyone was buying instead of the 10S. <laughs> so instead of making it the budget phone, they just made it the regular phone, the iPhone 11. Uh, really all it brought was a second camera and that's the review. <laughs> You could get a 10R for a lot less money, and there really was no reason to ever buy an iPhone 11. So I'm giving this D tier. Nah, that's E tier. This is an E tier phone. It wasn't bad, but just it was the same as the iPhone 10R, which was way cheaper when the iPhone 11 came out. Let's get to the iPhone 12 Pro. This phone brought with it the square design that had been absent since the iPhone 5S. And while, yes, I must admit it is fairly handsome, I will maintain to my deathbed that it is not as comfortable to hold. Uh, the Pro phones in particular brought some weird features, like the iPad Pro's LiDAR sensor on the rear. Oh, <laughs> super, super useful. Uh, no. It also brought ProRes RAW photos, which um, nobody cares. And it brought 5G support, which is kind of meh. MagSafe also came for the first time to this device, which is kind of neat, but also has a bunch of problems. I've explained those in my video you can watch here. I'm like, where, where would the card be here? <laughs> and then there is, uh, for the first time ever, a 128 gigabyte base capacity rather than 64, which is good on a phone that is this expensive. But it came with no power adapter in the box. Uh, look, we were all super excited when the iPhone 12 came out because it was the first massive redesign that the iPhone had received in years and years and years and years. But in retrospect, it wasn't that good of a phone. Most benchmarks show that it had inferior battery life to the iPhone 11 Pro. Uh, and when your main new feature is that, oh, look, it's squared, um, that's not a good one. <laughs> so it was a good phone, sure, but it was entirely lazy and thus an E-tier phone, right, with the iPhone 11. All right, we're getting down to the wire. The iPhone 12 and 12 mini. After years of meh baseline phones, Apple came in swinging with the iPhone 12 and 12 mini. The LCD that was present on the 10R and the 11 was ditched in favor of an OLED panel, and it came with all of the same improvements that the iPhone 12 received, save for, well, ProRAW, the LiDAR, and uh, three cameras, and that's 
pretty much it. And the iPhone 12 mini was an exceptional addition for those that didn't want or need a larger phone, but didn't want to lose features like you would have on the SE. This was a, a fantastic lineup, and the mini was the phone that I used for the entire year. I loved it. But that was during quarantine, and once I started leaving my home with more frequency again, the battery life on the mini was just too poor to continue using. Needless to say, these are A-tier phones. Maybe Apple's best phones, best bang for the buck phones ever. Um, they're really, really good. Now we get to the iPhone 13 Pro this year. So why do you even need to watch this? I guess this is my review of the iPhone 13 Pro. I've got one right here in my pocket. <laughs> this year's improvements were cameras, 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 and more cameras. There's a new cinematic mode that I literally have not used one time, not once, and I never will. Um, it added ProRes video, which is cool, except for you have to use uh, USB 2 lightning speeds to get it off your device, so that's worthless. Uh, but the cameras themselves, they are much improved and a massive step up from the iPhone 12 Pro. They take exceptional photos, and I have found myself this year taking more photos with my iPhone than I have with any other iPhone in recent memory because the photos look so great. Um, and then ProMotion. <laughs> Look, I am annoyed that it took Apple so long to bring high frame rate displays to the iPhone, but now that it's here, it has ruined me for pretty much any other 60 hertz Apple product, including the otherwise really, really good iPad mini. And then, because it's an LTPO display, it's kind of ruined me for pretty much every other Android phone as well, because the battery improvements are massive on this phone. I have never had an iPhone that is as good as the iPhone 13 Pro in the battery department. The iPhone 11 Pro is pretty close, might tie up, but way better than the 12, which was worse than the iPhone 11 Pro. Big, big, big improvements this year. This is, at worst, a B-tier phone. Uh, no, you know what? This is an A-tier phone. Let's make this A-tier. <laughs> Now we get to the iPhone 13 and 13 mini. The improvements this year on these phones are really minor versus the iPhone 12 series. Now the OLED panel did get a little bit brighter this year. The notch is also a little bit smaller. It does help actually a little bit on the mini, but other than that, who cares? Um, and yeah, sure, it brought some of the software features like it has cinematic mode and whatnot. But the cameras are the same as on the iPhone 12, unlike the Pro phones, which got massive upgrades this year. Uh, so really the only improvement is battery life. Battery life is better, and on the mini phone that had horrible battery life, this is a big deal. Uh, since there's only a $100 price difference between the 12 and 13, it's worth getting over the 12 uh, for battery improvements alone. Oh, there's also a higher starting storage uh, capacity, but, but it's a really lazy phone, and uh, thus it's going to be a, a D-tier phone. With that said, there are more and more rumors that Apple is sadly done with the amazing iPhone mini. So I guess if you want a mini, buy the 13 mini while you still can. And that's it. That's the definitive iPhone tier list. This is not negotiable. Uh, you can't make this any better than it is. It's perfected. But if for some reason you're dumb and you have problems with this list, leave a comment down below. Let's discuss civilly or non-civilly. It's up to you. <laughs> Stay snazzy.